before it gets dark and I get cold. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome to the Arboretum. I'm George. Um, we're looking out over the Schoharie Valley. And the moon should rise someplace over this way. Should have brought my compass out, but this is essentially the sun setting over there. So this makes this east over here. And it should be coming up shortly, but we'll walk around. I also forgot to bring it out. Um, I have, um, I'm hoping to uh, hoot for some owls, see if we get some owls. I can hear a cricket right now. So it's a field cricket. And we can tell the temperature by counting the number of chirps. So if you hear those chirps, I'll just go in my hand so that this is when I'm hearing a chirp. So we're going to count chirps for 15 seconds and then add 37. That's the technique for that. So I'm going to, I've got my timer set for 15 seconds and we'll see. I'm thinking the temperature should be maybe high 50s, but let's see what happens with this. So get ready. Here goes. So as soon as I say go, I'm hitting my button to start my 15 second timer. Count the number of chirps you can hear. Here goes. One, two, three, go. I had 26, I think, if I count it correctly. 26 and 37 is 59. So uh, by this chirping of this cricket, I would say it's 59 degrees here. Um, it's a little cool. Um, you can look here. Let's see here. Um, we can get a little bit of colors. We can see some maples turning right there. And, of course, the evergreens will stay green. Uh, I believe that's a red maple, it looks like, down over there. Um, the goldenrod is past. Uh, most of the goldenrod is going to seed. Uh, over in there, what are the yellows over in there? Well, I'm not sure. It might be maples. Um, here's an oak. Well, it's hard to see. Oak sort of turned brownish. I hear a towhee couple towhees. They should be moving out pretty soon. Migration is well underway. So um, um, I'm also hoping that um, we'll have um, coyote sounds. I brought a coyote call. See if we get any coyotes cranking up and calling out. Um, it's a gorgeous evening. Let me so the sun set moments ago. Well, it set quite a while, and it was uh, shining up through the bottoms of the clouds, coloring some of the bottoms pink. I was prepping to get ready. I didn't have a chance. I didn't uh, take a picture of it, unfortunately. But, um, and up over, just to give you an idea of the sky, we have some clouds tonight. I'm hoping it stays clear enough that we get the moon because what I plan to do is use my spotting scope right there, and I'm going to digiscope. Oh, what's digiscoping? Well, I hear another bird. I hear several birds. Should have been, there's been migrants coming through, but let me go with the spotting scope and do this this way, and you'll see uh, what I call what's called digiscoping. Well, that's a song sparrow down over in here. We might stay around. Some song sparrows stay around for the winter time. So I'm going to look from here. I'm looking all the way across the valley. Actually, more than the valley. I'm looking at the Helderberg Escarpment, where Thatcher Park is. And so let's see if I can digiscope this and what it looks like. So with a digiscope, we take a camera, a cell phone camera, and uh, place it up to the um and let's see if i can oops i'm gonna have to let me try to get my camera off the tripod for a moment and oh 
over in here. Let me switch to this. And right there it is. That is the Helderberg Escarpment through my spotting scope. Um, that's like, uh, I think, 22 power. And that's where Thatcher Park is. So I've always uh, contemplated, wouldn't it be cool to um, have a, um, a uh, um, scope or a, a laser and laser back and forth between the Helderberg Escarpment, the Thatcher Park, and here at the Arboretum. Although I'm not sure, I'm going to guess that's the, like the overlook at Thatcher is on the other side of that little um, hillside there where it's sloping down because the, the actual escarpment sort of curves around. So I see several people are on. I don't see them showing up on my comments. Um, I'm not sure. I can't remember how that worked with the Arboretum before because I know I'm on the Arboretum's Facebook page doing this. And oops, sorry, let me switch back to um, the view over here. And the moon is not yet up. I googled and it said something like 650 something is moonrise. And right now it's 655. But of course, 650 moonrise depends on where, um, where the information is based on for example when we say that sunset was at about six uh 650 if you google when this sunset and you'll get a time depends on where you are in the time zone if you're way to the east um the sun will have set um at say 650 but if you're way to the western edge of the time zone, so you're past Buffalo into Pennsylvania, and I forget exactly where the time zone shifts from the eastern time zone to the central time zone, if you're right about the border of the central uh, time zone and east time zone, the sun will still have almost an hour to set compared to when it's set way east of Boston. And um, so... Um, that's because our time zones, the time of 12 noon, is really when the sun is directly south of us. Up, oh, I do see some people joining in. I don't know, there's a bunch of icons in the upper view of my camera, but I see Kathy Gillespie and Will Asher. Welcome to the Arboretum. Um, and... Just listen to crickets. There's a family that's here enjoying the Arboretum at dusk. There was a gentleman here. Um, the interesting thing with the Arboretum um, in the pandemic is there's been an upswing of people using it. Just, you know, a place to get outside, socially distant, enjoying nature, enjoying fresh air, um, and staying healthy. Um, so it's that's been uh, an interesting, uh, well, it's a silver lining of this cloud of the pandemic. The other silver lining is that um, because of the pandemic and my programs normally in real time with people, visitors right here, um, I've uh, opted to obviously not do the programs live with people in attendance. So doing it online, um, we found that we have a larger following. We had a lot of people that join in later and can enjoy the Arboretum and maybe eventually become members and help support the Arboretum and such. But so speaking of the Arboretum, I um, would just like to mention for starters, the Atlantis Arboretum is a living museum of trees. That's what an Arboretum is. And it was started by two men, George Landis and Fred Lape. The property here was the family homestead for Fred Lape. His dear close friend George Landis um, shared an interest in trees with Fred and began collecting tree specimens of which were planted here at the Arboretum. 
Um, and when um, George Landis passed away, he his will gave his whole estate to, or I guess, I don't know if his whole estate, but a good portion of the estate to Fred Lape for use to develop the Arboretum. And Fred then, therefore, then called the Arboretum, George, the George Landis Arboretum. Today, I think we've shortened it up to the Landis Arboretum. So um, the Landis Arboretum is a a uh, private not-for-profit organization, and we invite anyone that happens to be uh, watching this video at any point or enjoying uh, to come and enjoy the grounds, but to also participate, um, perhaps become a member, help out as a volunteer, um, and help support the um, organization that runs this because it's a um, mostly volunteer group of people that work on it. There is a paid director and office person but, uh, and then maintenance people, the groundkeeper people. But a lot of the work is done by volunteers. And uh, two of the major events, and this year both of them were canceled or had to be modified and changed, were uh, plant sales. Um, I'm coming to the end of what I might call the warm season programming that I do, nature programs and nature walks and bird walks and such. Um, this is the second to the last program I'll do for the year. Um, the last program I do, it's a tradition that I do a Halloween owl prowl. So somehow I geared up to have two October programs as dusk nighttime programs. So uh, even though I will do some owl hooting, uh, perhaps hooting for great horned owls like this. barred owls like this we often hear barred owls here more often than great horned owls i think some of the families hear that i'm wondering if they think it's a real owl and might try doing screech owls also I've never heard screech owls here. Um, as I mentioned, we'll try to do some um, try to do some uh, coyote calling and see if we might hear coyotes. I have heard coyotes here before. So, and let's see a couple others. I'd like to welcome in Catherine. Hello, and Laura. Thanks for joining me tonight. I'm holding off from moving to the spot because I'd like to see the moon rise, but I should have been remembered what it was like last year with the moon rise. Oh, but anyways, the last program of the year I'll mention is, uh, for my programs, will be the Halloween Owl Prowl, which is uh, on Halloween, which is a full moon that night. So October of 2020, it has a blue moon. Um, the, Bloom the uh, full moon um, on Halloween. How does that work? Well, you see, the moon has a very constant cycle of 29 to 30 days. Um, the ancients measured that going way back in time. And matter of fact, that's the origins of the word month, um, where you had a moon cycle. Eventually that moon cycle became to be called a month, which then eventually became a month. So in this monthly cycle, of course, the calendar has been played around with and days added or days taken away. But um, it was based on looking at the phases of the moon from a full moon to the um, third quarter to the... Um, excuse me, from a full moon to a, um, yes, a full moon to a third quarter, to a new moon, to a first quarter, to a full moon. And that takes uh, about 29 days. And 
what happens then is if you have a month with 30 days in the month or 31 and a full moon is on the first day of that month or if it's a long month like October even the second day you would end up with two full moons because of the uh, regularity of the moon cycle so we have a moon to, full moon tonight and a full moon tomorrow I don't see the full moon yet so let's wander back over to the field area and see what if there's some things here we can look at the setting sun oh, well with the western sky very little color now those clouds built up pretty quickly on the western sky and um, from here once we get the moon i think we'll go and try to do some calling owl calling over there you can see a little bit of the sky color of the setting sun where it's cut some color just like that over there some little bit of color last night I did a color of uh, uh, autumn colors nature walk at home and we had a little bit of a better sunset of course where I live I'm on the other side of the Schoharie Valley, so we have a better view of the sun setting over the Schoharie Valley than we have here. So, let me look over in here, and I'm going to grab the coyote call. to some of the other nighttime insects so at this point in time fall all these insects have spent all summer growing the crickets and katydids and other nighttime calling insects started off as eggs in the springtime hatching right now those crickets and katydids the females are laying eggs that will overwinter and be the young of next spring the spring of spring and summer of 2021 so these guys that are chirping and calling they're calling looking for mates and they will um the adult females will lay eggs and as soon as we have a killing frost it'll be very quiet so we still have the last of these insects because we've yet to have a really um, a very cold series of killing frosts. And I'm walking towards where, no, I'm talking towards the Meeting House Pond. And for those of you that are Arboretum members, you've probably heard of some of the um, renovation and building work here. They finally finished the extension on the meeting house, giving us a winterized uh, facility to be able to do winter programs. And one of the winter programs that's definitely going to be going on that we've done in the past, it's, this is going to make it much easier to do, is our snowshoe walks. And we've got snowshoe walks scheduled that will be scheduled for I think it's Sundays, the first Sundays of the month, snowshoe walks, or maybe second Sunday, snowshoe walks, I forget. But I'll end up doing one or two of those. And Fred might do one, and I'm not sure who else. But that'll be December, January, and February, I believe. So I'm hearing an airplane, of course, but several other crickets and night orthopterans the crickets and katydids and grasshoppers grasshoppers of course are diurnal they're not going to be doing anything right now at nighttime but the katydids and crickets belong to a group of insects called orthopteran or orthoptera actually so we call them orthopterans but here are at least two different species maybe three one of them I know is the field cricket that we use to try to tell the temperature. But just to give another look around as it's getting darker and hoping that we 
you get the sun coming or the moon rising pretty soon. It's a gorgeous night. A little chilly. There is a breeze. I hope it's not interfering too much with the microphone on the phone. But, oops, where's my focus? Oh, there's the focus. Why did I? Oh, maybe did I move too fast? And hello, Anita. Uh, sounds great. Thanks, Will. And hello, Shannon. Hear the dog down the road. So let's go back and see if the moon is going to rise up. The thing is, is that we have clouds on the eastern horizon, so I think that might affect us being able to see the moon. So, I might do a walk down the hillside and head for the Great Oak, the new Great Oak. So, um, the, and the new Great Oak is, I believe, a red oak. Whereas the old oak that was the, uh, was the uh, uh, mascot, so to speak, of the Arboretum was a white oak. Um, there are a bunch of white oaks in that area, but the oak that has been uh, taken over as the, the new mascot is... Um, oh, there's the moon coming up. I missed it. Here it is. There's the moonrise, right over there. So we got a gorgeous orange moon. This is the hunter's moon. Oh no, excuse me, this is the harvest moon. The moon at the end of October is the hunter's moon. So I'm gonna get over here and set up over here like this. Ooh, I'm gonna get this spotting scope onto it. So, I can zoom in with the phone, but can't get as good of a shot as with the spotting scope. So you hear the crickets down here, it's a little warmer. There's a stone wall that's absorbed some heat from the sun that's still gonna be radiating out heat. So that cricket's got a nice warm spot there. So right there is the moon rising. And let me get it in the spotting scope and then digiscope it. Here is the moon rise in the digiscope. And where is it? Let me get it set up. There it is, the moon rise at 22 power with my spotting scope. Try to get it set up properly there. So there's a couple moon songs that I would sing with kids at campfire programs, and one is I see the moon, the moon sees me, brilliant as only the moon can be. God bless the moon and God bless me, God bless the ones I love. Over the mountains and over the sea, back where my heart is longing to be. God bless the moon and God bless me, God bless the ones I love. Dedicate that to my mom who just turned 93. She taught me that song a long time ago. She also taught me this song. Bug, bug, tu, bug, bug, tu, bug, bug, tu, lam, bing, tu, lam, bing, tu, lam, bing, tu, lam, bow, we can, bow, we can, bow, we can, bow, we kalanai, 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 bunai. And that, I believe, is either Bicol or Tagalog languages in the Philippines, which translates to Mr. Moon, Mr. Moon, looking down at me pretty soon, pretty soon, round and round you'll be. I think a bit of that redness is maybe some smoke still in the sky from the fires out west. I'm not sure. Um, but it's also maybe some of that cloud. So when the moon is higher up and we get a view of it, I think I'll come back. So let's do a little walk 
to um, into the down the trail to um, the Great Oak and then do some owl hooting there and maybe call for coyotes there. Hmm, should I try walking down through the field here and make a shortcut or go down? No, I guess I'll go down the mowed pathway. So. course all of the all of the uh, fireflies have been long gone well they're not long gone they're in the ground as larvae um, the female fireflies laid their eggs in the spring and their larvae will spend all have spent all summer down in the ground um, and they will overwinter there and then come springtime they will be the fireflies that will emerge around the first week of June or so. I always know it's June when the fireflies come on out. So, we're going down the pathway. This is basically the lawn area. Down through some of the planted trees. Um, the arboretum with uh, the trees planted in the collection, as it's called, is on uh, mostly to the west of where we are right now. Although there are a variety of trees here in this little pathway, there's a new planting of lilacs over here that we're passing. Uh, the lilac bloom in May is gorgeous here, so if you've never been to the Arboretum, May is a great time to come for the lilacs. And the lilacs will be blooming before the perennial gardens will really fire it up. And then summertime comes in and the perennial gardens are the really nice what a lot of people come to see. But um, I stay mostly on the wild side where it's um, secondary growth forest. There is a section of the Arboretum that's old growth. Um, very steep areas of the Schoharie hillside valley wall um, very so steep that they weren't logged throughout the 17 or 1800s and so we have basically what is old growth forest that's there quite a few hemlocks the hemlocks were one of the first trees to really be taken out um, in the forests of New York as Europeans came in and settled in and they were taken out mostly for the tanning industry where the bark was stripped and there's the moon over there coming up through our farm pond. You'll see the reflection of the water in the farm pond down below. It's a little farm pond. So there's four ponds here at the Arboretum. The farm pond, and notice no frog sounds. The bullfrogs and green frogs, they've gotten cold enough that they are getting ready to hibernate. And the um spring peepers every now and then you'll hear a spring peeper I was hearing them the other night and spring peepers will peep well into the autumn i've heard spring peepers peeping in november when um, even a little bit of snow flurries are flying around and what i think is happening in that case is that they are young of the year spring peepers so they're maturing spring peepers and um, or you might call them teenagers I guess maybe not fully mature so they're starting to uh, mature and the photo period is the same as springtime medium length days not the long long days of summer not the short short uh, days of winter um, have fall and autumn where they are equinoxes or equal day, equal night. So that's got them confused. And the temperature has got them confused because the temperature would be the kind of temperature that you'd have in the springtime. And so I think they're confused and they think, oh, now's the time to call for mates. With all of the frogs, the spring peepers, the wood frogs, the tree frogs, the green frog, the bullfrog, our leopard frog, our pickerel frog. It's only the males that call. Stop every now and then and check out the moon. 
coming up over there. Um, beautiful moonrise. We'll have a nice thing of moon. We'll go out to the out to the um, the knoll where the great oak is, and do some hooting and calling there. Hope I don't scare the family. There was at least one family with some kids here before. Um, they, I think they've gone into the woods. So if I do the coyote call, whether they might go, oh no. So I'm following the path. Basically, this area is very lawn-like, mowed, easily accessible. Um, but back to the old growth area, there's a lengthy trail. I'm not sure exactly how long it is probably three quarters of a mile or so and depends on how much of a loop you want to do um, but it's huge huge trees mostly hemlocks because it was so steep they really couldn't cut those hemlocks for the tanning industry and um, never cut them for lumber or anything like that So you can hear the different crickets down in here. Someone coming down the trail. I'll step off to the side here. Hello. Hi there. Hi, Kim. <laughs> it's way prettier up on the hill. <laughs> it's a gorgeous moon. So, uh, I can hear some other people on one of the trails over here. That turns off to the side, so. And so now we're coming into some of the forest area and this is not part of the collection this is just basically wild forest the trees here um, are probably in the range of 80 to 100 years old um, a lot of this area was pasture land and then when the pastures were no longer used nature does its thing nothing stays the same in nature it's always changing. There's competition for sunlight and water among the plants. First comes in the grasses and herbaceous forbs, and then you get brushy, bushy um, uh, shrubs like the viburnums, and they outcompete the grasses and things like goldenrod. Although goldenrod tries its best to hold on, goldenrod actually has a um, phytotoxin where it kills other competing plants that's why you have massive fields of golden rods because they actually out compete or they are actually killing off other plants that try to grow in but eventually woody plants come in birds a lot of the woody plants the viburnums they have seeds in fruits that the birds eat and so a bird flies around and drops the seeds or goes to the bathroom drops the seeds and so then um, you have um, these shrubby viburnums coming in. And then you have um, trees that the wind blows their seeds in, like aspens. And uh, more birds come fly in and deposit cherry seeds. And you have some of the early successional plants, like aspen and birch. And then you have the final mature forest succession plants like the oaks and um, maples and things like that. Again, seeds spread by the wind or by animals and such. Oh, right next to their house. Hello, how you doing? Good, how you doing? It's Good. Isn't it? Oh, it is. Yeah. We're walking up, there's the moon right there. And so we have the hill over in here, and right there you can see that's a little stub of the giant oak up there where the oak was on this hill. 
and so we'll stop there and oop I just heard one last Katie did I think Katie did have even finished up their calling and the females have laid eggs so there's really not much more going on with them other than eating and staying alive until the frost comes and does them in so I'll do some hooting here we'll stop and listen and then we'll walk back the same way we came and I'll get the spotting scope onto the um, moon for another look at the moon and if I can find Andromeda I'll try to get Andromeda spotting scope I'm not sure if the clouds it looks like it might be clouded over we do have a fair bit of clouds so yeah you can't see it here but this is we're underneath the new mascot of the arboretum a red oak that is at least several hundred years old I'm not sure if Fred and the staff have come up with an age for it how do you age big trees like this well one of the ways is you literally take a little sample out of it you drill in and you pull out a tiny core and then you count the rings um, on the core so here we are here let's see what we can see um, well, I'll leave us pointing towards the, the skyline. Maybe I'll go like this. And I'm going to sit here and hoot and yowl. So you can see a little bit of that. I don't know if you'll see my silhouette. A little bench here. So I'm going to sit for a bit. Maybe give it oh, a squirrel head. It's dinner here. I just felt the cap of an acorn. And I could feel that the side of the cap was bitten and broken off. That's what squirrels do. They bite off a little bit of the cap so they can remove the acorn seed from the cap and then proceed to peel the acorn. If it's a gray squirrel, they actually peel the acorn. Hear acorns falling off of the oaks here. And you see a little bit of the horizon in the valley. So I use a red light. And you can see the red light here is the coyote collar that I'm going to use. Use the red light so it doesn't disturb um, animals. And so small volume. And I'll just do 
on this one here. It's a coyote howling. It's called the locator. experimenting with coyote calls. I'm going to be a super cool program to be able to do coyote calls, but coyotes are so wary. I hear them around home all the time, and it seems like they're right there in the backyard. And yet you hardly ever see them or find any other signs other than their scat. Of course, when you got to go, you got to go. And of course, that's going to be around and be very prevalent. So that's not going to be hidden away. But uh, um, I get pictures of them all the time on my trail cameras. They're definitely around. And I've heard them here at the Arboretum before. Try a few more calls here. And then this call has uh, several distress calls from um, little animals like rabbits. And what happens is if a coyote hears a distress call or a, um, a call from an injured rabbit or one that's been attacked by something, then the coyotes might respond to it by saying, ooh, there could be a free meal or an easy meal there. So this one also has a coyote food fight. I wonder if it's like Animal House. course it sounds like a dog's fighting because of course that's what coyotes are. They're our largest wild dog. Uh, we have two other wild dogs in our forest here, the gray fox and the red fox. Sometimes people think that uh, some of the foxes, particularly the gray fox, are cats because they can, do have an ability, to, a pretty good ability to climb trees. And then some people will say, well these coyotes, they're really uh, uh, wolves or koi wolves and matter of fact some scientists have been proposing the thought that these might be really actually koi wolves in that our northern coyotes definitely have wolf genetics in them they uh, in coming back into New York when the first pioneers had cleared the forest and changed the habitat and the large predators were gone uh, when the coyotes came back in from the west the coyotes that came from the northern parts, um, in other words, actually going, say, over the northern areas of the Great Lakes, they mated with wolves and had some wolf genes in their progeny then. So our northern coyotes are definitely bigger than some of our southern coyotes because there was also a movement decades later, the movement of these koi wolves, as they might be called, was in the early 1900s by the 1940s there was a movement of the um, the typical smaller coyote of the american southwest through into the southern tier of new york and uh, sort of here sort of in the uh, sort of the great lakes area in central new york uh, coming through the, the southern catskills is sort of the meeting uh, grounds for these two different coyote populations. So many of the coyotes we see around here are truly, truly large animals. But they're basically dogs, wild dogs. Ooh.
All I hear is acorns falling out of the trees. The who cooks you all, all call of the barred owl and the hooting of a great horned owl and the whistling of the eastern screech owl. Well, let's head back to where I have the spotting scope and we'll end with a spotting scope view of the moon that's well risen and we'll be able to see some of the craters and the markings on the moon. Um, before I say good night. Get back on the trail. It's hard to my night vision, the cell phone screen is so bright, it wrecks your night vision. As a matter of fact, in the spring I tried sneaking up on American woodcock. The male American woodcocks arrive first in oh the middle of March or so, and they begin to find uh, singing territories where they will call for mates in display. So they have a song. Well, it's hard to call it a song. We call it painting, a sound that goes eh, eh, eh. And then after several, 10, 15, 20 of those, eh, it will fly up into the air and make a whistling sound with its wingtips. A very flute-like kind of whistling sound with its wingtips. And then return back to its singing spot and do it again. And then fly up and have that whistling sound. And if you try to sneak up to where you heard them singing or painting while they're in the air and settle down before they come to land. And how would you know they're coming to land? Because that little <whistles> will start to change and it'll go <whistles> as they get ready to land. And you stop and you wait for them. You can sneak right up to them. And I was doing that with, um, the, um, with my cell phone, taking people on an on a, a online live woodcock sneak up and I think the woodcock got scared from the glare of the light on my face and oh, so Nancy says looking through a good telescope my spotting scope is not a good telescope but we can get a good look at the moon with that hello Nancy and Shannon um, and Kathy and Blue and Laura Julian uh, and Shannon, Will, Anita. Okay, so I think I've gotten everyone here. That's on Catherine and Kathy Gillespie and Will Asher. So the moon is looking really nice. Let's go back and get it up on the screen or up on my um, up on my um, spotting scope. So. Going down the trail, probably be about a five minute walk or so to where the spotting scope is. I think I'll go up the hill through the tall grass instead of following the trail. So once I get past over here, and you can't, it's hard to say, I don't think you can see it, but the moon is so bright, I uh, can't quite read a book with this light. The way it is mostly because my eyes can't totally adjust to the 
light because of the brightness of my cell phone. But we're walking past another pond. I call this the Woodland Pond, although it's on the edge of the woods and the field, sort of the boundary. But no frog calls at all. The frogs are probably, if they haven't yet uh, gone to hibernation, they soon will be sinking to the mud. Although I do know I've seen frogs still active under the ice in ponds. So they do remain somewhat active depending upon the conditions of the pond. have to look for ticks later on. I'm gonna go straight up the hill. Gotta raise up my tripod legs because they're snagging in the tall grass. Here looks like a little deer pathway. Going up this is safer than going down it. I probably hit a big hole and tumble over. almost thought I heard an owl. It might have been a dog. Ooh, it is a barred owl. Heard a barred owl calling from where we were. Did you hear that? It's a barred owl hooting back. Figures when I decide to leave is when the owl starts calling back. But we can wait till we'll hold off and definitely stay longer for the Halloween owl prowl. You can see it, the meeting house is coming up. Up the hill. Ooh, can you hear the owl? Yeah. There's an owl calling back right now. I think it moved into where I was calling before.
I'm online live for the Arboretum right now on Facebook. So we heard the owl and let's check out the moon. I'm winded from coming up the hillside. It's moved in a lot closer. Him to come all the way up to these trees right here. Okay, here's the moon. Let me get the camera off the tripod and we'll. Okay, here it goes. Let's see. It's so bright we can't even can't get details of the moon. Wait. Now I can't see the craters, the moon's so bright. Oh well. If I pull back. Nope. It's not the same as just looking through to see the craters. But can you hear the owl? Well, I'll just go with the moon this way. Oh, there's two owls. Someone had a question, so let me look through here. Kathy asks, is it true that owls have their babies in winter? No. Um, their babies hatch in usually around June, uh, May and June. Um, and by the time, at this time of year, the babies are all grown up and flying around. And matter of fact, part of these barred owls I might be saying, hey, you guys, go find your own place to live. So that barred owl's gotten in closer. It's right where we were calling before. I think it flew in. See if it flies in closer to here. That's the barred owl. The books say they say, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? And let's see. I think I've gotten most of the comments. And it's a gorgeous evening. I'm going to sit down here for a little second and see if the barred owls get a little bit closer. There's a family that's enjoying the beauty of the moonrise and a gorgeous evening with a young ornithologist calling to the barred owls themselves. Ah, can you hear the two different voices? Two different owls off in the woods over there. So dark you can't see. <laughs> yeah, there's at least two barred owls out there. One is higher pitch and one is lower pitch. I wonder if that's male and female. Because I know great horned owls. There's a difference in pitch between the male and the female. <coughs> There's also a dog barking back to us. Well, thanks for coming along on my walk tonight. Um, you can always look at this video. It'll be stored on the Facebook's webpage. You can always go to it or on, um, on the Arboretum's Facebook webpage. You can go in and um, take someone through the take someone through the uh, the walk again.
Speaking of that, the Arboretum is always looking for volunteers and, of course, contributions. Um, if you feel moved to contribute, you can do so online, I believe, or you could mail a check in to the Arboretum. Go to the Arboretum's website. Um, the Arboretum always struggles to get uh, funding. Uh, the director, Fred, writes grants, but a lot of it is support from people who enjoy nature and the Arboretum. So with that, I'll say good night, be safe, stay healthy, and definitely make sure you get outdoors.